glorious good news that we have just sung, O oh Lord, is so good. Sins forgiven, guilt wiped away, death conquered, and our Savior whom we love returning. This changes everything. We live between your death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, and your glorious return. Looking back in faith, looking forward in faith, we cling to you, Lord Jesus. There is nowhere else for us to turn. There is no other Savior, no other way, no other love, no other good news than you. What a privilege it is to have your name on our lips, to have, ha have our names written on your heart. We pray, O oh God, as we think some more this morning on the glories of your resurrection and all that it means for us, that you would receive all glory and honor and praise even as we rejoice and delight. We ask it in your name. Amen. You may be seated. If you have lost a loved one, you know the sting of death. You know the darkness. You have no doubt been perplexed. Perhaps you have felt like I have, that you might just see that one again, lurking around a corner. Perhaps you've awakened from dreams, thinking that your dad had just played one big practical joke and he's actually still here. <laughs> the thought that you could see one again thrills the heart and the reality that you can't breaks the heart all over again. We are thinking again today on the one who conquered death. Who brings about a reunion of lost loved ones for those in him who brings about the reunion of body separated from soul in glorious resurrection. Because he himself rose from the dead, he conquered death itself. This morning, what I want to look at with you are a number of passages relating to the consequences of Jesus' resurrection. Titled the message this morning, Because He Rose... That is also the sermon outline this morning. Because Jesus rose from the dead, and we'll look at four consequences. There are many. We'll examine four this morning. First of all, because Jesus rose from the dead, he is God. He is God. Now, this is not to say that Jesus became God when he rose from the dead or that his deity is a consequence of his resurrection. Rather, it's the other way around. Because Jesus is God, he rose from the dead as a necessary consequence. But it would be like saying, it's raining because the windows are wet. In other words, the manifestation of the rain is the evidence of the wet windows. It would be like rehearsing with the woman, the sinful woman, forgiven of her sins in Luke 7, 47. It was said of her that she was forgiven of her sins because she loved much. Now, she did not unearn forgiveness by loving Jesus. Her manifest adoration of Jesus the Messiah was the result of her having been forgiven many sins. And it was so manifest that it could be said of her, she's forgiven. Well, how do you know? Look how much she loves Jesus. Similarly here, we could say, oh, he's God. 
How do you know? Because he walked out of his own grave by his own power. And Jesus is not the only one to have been raised from the dead. He is not the first to have been raised from the dead. Three are mentioned in the Old Testament. First Kings 17, Elijah raised the son of a widow from Zarephath. Second Kings 4, Elisha raised the son of a Shunammite woman. And it was said of Elisha that he would get a double portion of his mentor, Elijah. Well, in one particular way, that was uh, profoundly accurate. Um, Elijah, we have one recorded resurrection from him and two from Elisha. The second one from Elisha is remarkable. It's post-mortem. Elisha was buried in the grave and a dead man was thrown into Elisha's tomb. And when the corpse touched the bones, he was raised to life. Three individuals are mentioned to have been raised from the dead in Jesus' earthly ministry. In Luke 7, a widow's son. In Luke 8, Jairus' daughter, he was a synagogue leader. And of course, in John 11, Jesus' friend whom he loved, Lazarus, was raised. There were many more, of course, who were raised during Jesus' earthly ministry by him and through the agency of his disciples. At Jesus' own death in Matthew 27, it was said that the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom, the earth quaked, and the rocks were split open, and many people walked out of the tombs and appeared to others who witnessed During Jesus' earthly ministry, the disciples were commissioned, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, Matthew 10. And Jesus gave this report to the disciples of John the Baptist, Matthew 11, 5. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. This was a hallmark of Jesus' earthly ministry. After Jesus went to be with his father, after the resurrection Peter raised Tabitha, Acts 9, and Paul raised Eutychus in Acts 20. All of these resurrections were real physical bodily resurrections. These people were united with friends and families. However, they were still subjected to mortality. They would all die again. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ is different than all of them. Jesus Christ is the only one, firstly, who raised himself from the dead. He walked out of the tomb by his own power. When Old Testament prophets or New Testament disciples or the apostles raised people from the dead, they were not doing so by their own power. They were agents used by God to raise others from the dead. A second way Jesus' resurrection is fundamentally different is he was never to die again. His resurrection was permanent. And thirdly, Jesus was a permanent, glorified resurrection body. No one else has this yet. No one has this glorified resurrection body that Jesus possessed after his resurrection. This is the first of a radically different kind of bodily resurrection. It is the kind that believers will experience. Philippians 3.21, the Lord Jesus Christ will transform our, literally, our body of humiliation to be conformed with his glorious resurrection body. God raised the widow's son in Elijah's ministry. God raised the son of the Shunammite woman in Elisha's ministry. God raised the corpse tossed onto Elisha's bones. And when God came to earth, In the person of Jesus, the Messiah, he raised the widow's son, he raised Jairus' daughter, and he raised Lazarus and the many more unnamed, all done by his power. And it was again by God's power that Jesus' disciples raised others from the dead, all of these to die again. But Easter morning, Resurrection Sunday, the Son of God, who has life in himself, took up his own life. I want you to turn to the Gospel of John. John the Apostle, in his Good News account, carefully demonstrates that Jesus of Nazareth was none other than God in the flesh. And the resurrection of Jesus is a key part of John's demonstration of that. Look at John chapter 5, verse 26. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he gave to the Son, also to have life in himself. Jesus the Christ, 
Jesus, the Son of God, possesses life inherently. All of us possess life derived. We are dependent creatures. He is the creator of all life, the sustainer of all life, and he has life in himself. Turn to John chapter 10. In John 10, 17, we read this from Jesus. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. This is exactly what Pastor Matt was reading to the kids earlier, wasn't it? That Jesus let himself die. Jesus, the one in charge of death, permitted death to take him. No one else has done this. No one else breathes his last of his own accord. Every heartbeat and every breath is in the hand of God. Jesus, the God-man who has life in himself, lays down his own life intentionally. And we recognize in the gospel narratives that Jesus was betrayed, that he was run up by a kangaroo court, and he was beaten and mocked and scourged and tortured and murdered at the hands of men. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter. And yet he was in charge as the sovereign over all things of every single detail of it, including his last breath. He surrendered his spirit. He was not a mere victim. He was the sovereign God of history working out his plan of salvation. Turn to John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, verses 26 to 28, the disciples, the followers of Jesus are in an upper room. Some have seen the resurrected Christ, others had not. Thomas in particular had not. And Jesus appeared to them and he entered the room though the doors were locked. That is, Jesus physically entered a room in a physical glorified body, a body in which he ate food and was touchable and he passed through the walls. In John 20, 26, after eight days, his disciples were again inside, Thomas with them. Jesus came, listen, the doors having been shut, they were shut and they remained shut as he entered. And he stood in their midst and he said, peace be with you. They probably were not at peace in that startling moment. Verse 27, then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger, see my hands, Reach here with your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. And notice Thomas's response, experiencing the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He exclaims, my Lord and my God. Thomas knew that the resurrection without a doubt proved that Jesus is who he said he was. He is the word become flesh. He is the author of life, the prince of life. He is Lord of all lords. He is king of all kings. And he conquered death. I want to read for you an extended quote from J.I. Packer's classic work, Knowing God, in his chapter on the incarnation. The incarnation, of course, just means the enfleshment of the second person of the Trinity that God the Son became fully human. Here's what Packer says. The really staggering claim of Christianity is that Jesus of Nazareth was God made man. That the second person of the Godhead became the second man determining human destiny. The second representative head of the race and that he took humanity without loss of deity so that Jesus of Nazareth was as truly and fully divine as he was human. 
The Word became flesh. God became man. The divine Son became a Jew. The Almighty appeared as a helpless human baby, unable to do more than lie and stare and wiggle and make noises. Needing to be fed and changed and taught to talk like any other child. And there was no illusion and no deception in this. The babyhood of the Son of God was a reality. And the more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as is this truth of the incarnation. And this is the real stumbling block in Christianity. It is here that Jews and Muslims, Unitarians, Jehovah's Witnesses, and many of those who feel the difficulties concerning the virgin birth, the miracles of Jesus, the atonement, the resurrection, the reason they have come to grief. It is from misbelief about the incarnation that difficulties at other points in the gospel story truly spring. But once the incarnation is grasped as a reality, these other difficulties dissolve. If Jesus had been no more than a very remarkable godly man, the difficulties in believing what the New Testament tells about his life and his work would be truly mountainous. But if Jesus was the same person as the eternal word, the Father's agent in creation, through whom also he made the world then it is no wonder if fresh acts of creative power marked his coming into the world and his life in it and his exit from it. It is not strange that he, the author of life, should rise from the dead. It is rather more startling that he should die at all. "'Tis mystery all. The immortal dies," wrote Wesley. But there is no comparable mystery in the immortal's resurrection. And if the immortal Son of God did really submit to taste death, it is not strange that such a death would have significance, saving significance, for a doomed race. End quote. The resurrection demonstrates that Jesus is God. Secondly, sins are forgiven. Sins are forgiven. Because he rose... Sins are forgiven. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8. Because he rose, sins are forgiven. That simply means that his sacrificial payment as an atonement on the cross was acceptable payment. That what he did on the cross was actually enough to pay for sins committed by everyone who would ever believe. Sins past, present, and future. All heaped up on him. Read with me Romans 8, verses 33 and 34. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Listen, friends, if Jesus had been merely a man, then his finite constitution could only die a man's death. And... In his finite human capacity, he could not have borne the sins of others. And if he had been a mere man, constituted with a sin nature, working itself out in sinful activities like all of us, then his death could only have been the death of a sinner and would have been just payment and just punishment for the sins of that sinner. And of course, it would have taken him forever to pay it. Do you understand, friends, what the cost of sin is against an infinitely holy God? A finite being can only pay infinite justice if he or she pays it forever and ever and ever. And if Jesus had been a mere man, though the best of men... He could have only paid for his own sins and it would have taken him forever to do it and he never would have walked out of the grave. The fact that Jesus exited his tomb means that as the sin bearer, he had enough capital to pay all the crime's debt. All of it. 
for everyone who would cling to him in faith. Every sinful deed, every vile thought, every foul motive, all the secrets of the heart he bore in himself at the cross, took upon himself the Father's wrath in all of its infinite fury and soaked it up, absorbed it, drank down that wrath to the last dregs and eliminated it. So that for all who believe, sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. That which is scarlet has been made white as snow. That which is red as crimson is made white like white wool. Jesus was a sin bearer. And because he was the God man as sin bearer, he could actually pay for all of it. And the grave couldn't hold him. That is Paul's argument in Romans 8. Look carefully at it with me. Two rhetorical questions. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? And the answer demanded is, no one. Never mind that we have an adversary, the accuser, Satan himself, who makes his entrance into the throne room of God as a regular occupation, accusing the brethren night and day. Never mind that he stands there. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? None. Why? God, the justifying one. It's a sentence in our English Bibles. God is the one who justifies. Second rhetorical question, verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? The demanded answer, no one. Why? Christ Jesus is the one who died. Yes, rather, who was raised? Who makes intercession for us at the right hand of God? Do you understand the import of the resurrection? <laughs> the sentence doesn't end with Jesus died, but that his payment was accepted. He rose from the dead to prove it. There's a third consequence for us of the resurrection. It is that death has been altered. I want you to turn to John chapter 11. I am turning to Genesis chapter 5 in preparation for John chapter 11. Death is not accustomed to losing. Death wins a lot, if we can personify death for a few moments. Death has an unshakable grip on humanity. Death entered the world through one man's sin and spread so that every man is liable to physical mortality while at the same time being spiritually dead. In Genesis chapter 5, we have this first genealogy that is a list of people who lived one after the other. A father begat a son who begat a son who begat a son who begat a son. And in this genealogy, remarkably, we have this refrain over and over and over again. Adam lived and he died. Seth died. Enosh died. Kenan died. Mahalalel died. Jared died. Enoch, hold on to that thought for a second. <laughs> Methuselah died. Lamech died. Noah died later died. Over and over and over again in Genesis chapter 5, the unfolding of the history of man at its beginning. Death is everywhere. Of course, you have the exception here in this chapter in Genesis 5.21. It is Enoch. It is said that he walked with God and he was no more. There is another exception in the Old Testament. It is Elijah in 2 Kings 2. And Elijah did not die, but was carried up in a chariot of fire. But you know, 99.9999999999% rounds up to 100. So death is winning. 
Death is not accustomed to outliers. And all those who cheated death by the hand of God in a bodily resurrection died again. They were still mortal. So the mortality rate, if you do the math, you subtract Elijah and you subtract Enoch, but then you add back, oh, Jairus' daughter and Lazarus and Tabitha. You're back over 100% mortality rate. And I want you to see what the resurrection of Christ does with death in John 11. John 11 is this familiar story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And he makes this startling statement in John eleven twenty five. 25. Martha is wanting to be consoled by Christ about the death of her brother whom she loved, whom she knew Jesus loved. And she says, I know that we'll see him again in the resurrection. She has a resurrection hope, probably better articulated than most of the disciples. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And if you're reading carefully, you're thinking, well, these are two contradictory statements. Am I going to believe in Jesus and never die? Or am I going to live even if I do die believing in Jesus? And Jesus, I think, recognizes for us the seeming contradiction of this statement. And he says to Martha, do you believe this? Oh, Lord, help my unbelief. What does it mean? <laughs> I don't know. Yes, I believe you. But what does it mean to believe and never die and then to live even if I do die having believed? Jesus here is transforming death for believers and listen, this chapter, John 11, is just rich with pathos. The emotional palette on display in our Savior is striking. In verse 3, Jesus loved Lazarus. In verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and her Lazarus and, and her brother Lazarus. Jesus here is expressing a, a deeply felt emotional affection for a friend and for his friend's two sisters. He loved them with deep affection. He says in verse 11, our, our friend Lazarus, he says in verse 14, he is glad for the disciples' sakes that Lazarus is dead. That's only explicable if we understand the plan Jesus is after. He's made the promise that Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. And Jesus is glad that Lazarus' sickness went through death for the benefit of his disciples. And so Jesus' emotional love even for the disciples in this is on display. More emotions come out later. Verse 33, Jesus is deeply moved, literally outraged. What is Jesus angry justly at here in verse 33 at the death of his friend? He's angry at sin. He's angry at the consequences of death and unbelief. He's perhaps angry at the temporal mindedness of the religious hypocrites who are on the scene. And he is troubled of soul. In verse 35, Jesus wept. Compassion, grief, anger. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. Verse 38, he is deeply moved within when he came to Lazarus' tomb. And gratitude is on display in verse 41. He prays to his father, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. This emotional palette on display in Christ at the scene of death, even when Jesus, the sovereign one, knows his plan to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus knew the sting of death. Jesus knew what it was like to lose a loved one. And Jesus held the key to the conquering of death itself. Listen, when, when Jesus says to Martha, if you believe in me, You'll never die. And believe in me, you'll live even when you die. 
means that Jesus is transforming death for believers, even here in this scene. It's a preview of what he does by his work on the cross and his work from an empty tomb. It means that death gets altered for believers. Even in this very scene, he says to the disciples, our friend Lazarus is asleep. What is Jesus doing there? He is changing the vocabulary of death. He is not sensitizing death here or sanitizing death. He's not using some euphemism here the way we do. Oh, he's gone on to a better place. He, he's not uh, making this more palatable. He is fundamentally changing death for believers. And listen, death doesn't get altered for unbelievers. And so it should not be soft-pedaled. And Jesus is beginning here what the New Testament does in radically altering the vocabulary of death for believers. I love some of the ways uh, believers' death, physical death, is described. Oftentimes when a believer is martyred or murdered, the normal use of the words for death are used. But other than that, when, when believers die, they are described with other language. It is described in the vocabulary of transition, of a home going, a temporary tent being torn down and inheriting a building made not with hands. It, it is acquiring your citizenship. It is going home. It is most often in the New Testament called sleep. That doesn't mean some sort of unconscious state. It means from the perspective of believers who are here, well, they, they're still very much alive. They're, they're, we, we just don't get to talk to them. A believer's home going is referred to as absent from the body and present with the Lord. And it is described by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4 as safe. Listen, in the end, death loses. But in the meantime, even for believers, death is fundamentally altered. Life is changed for us because in a very real sense, new life begins at new birth and that new spiritual life never ends. Eternal life is a present possession of believers and it begins when you're born again. It begins when you believe in Jesus Christ and are rescued from your sins. Eternal life starts and never ends, even through your transition, through your last breaths on this earth. And turn to Revelation 20. Here the Bible personifies death for us to give us a stark, glorious reality. Revelation 20, 14, then death was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels, the place where everyone whose name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life is sent. Someone else or something else is sent to that lake of fire. Death itself. Death dies. So that there is no more place for it. No possibility of it ever. Look at Revelation 21.4. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. Why? The end of the verse. The first things have passed away. Everything from the beginning of creation up to the point of Revelation 20 the end of Revelation 20, they are the first things. Revelation 21 and 22 begin the next things and they never end. And what never exists in those next things is death. That inflexible power we experience here that separates people from people and separates material from immaterial in an individual. No longer relevant no longer necessary. And death, which has experienced victory after victory after victory after victory, so far, will lose in the end. Death dies because of the death and the resurrection of Messiah. Fourthly, last one here this morning. 
As a consequence of Jesus' resurrection, believers rise. Believers rise. Not like Lazarus, merely to an extension of physical life, subject again to mortality. And you remember the scene at the end of John 11, when the Pharisees found out that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, and they could not deny the miracle because the evidence was walking around? They tried to bury the evidence. They set out to kill Lazarus. Lazarus had a great story and then was a wanted man. When believers are raised, they are not raised merely to an extension of physical life subject to mortality, but to something new altogether. Listen to John 5, 21. Just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes we just read from John 11, believe in Jesus and you will live even if you die and you will live and never die. Both of those are true. Resurrection life begins at new birth and there is a now and later aspect to resurrection. What is the now part of resurrection life? Turn to Romans chapter six. If you've been born again by the grace of God, if God's Holy Spirit has made you alive so that you repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you experience justification and adoption and forgiveness of sins and all the benefits and you are now made heirs of Christ looking forward to a glorious inheritance, there is a present reality to resurrection life that you experience even now. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized or immersed into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Christian, don't you know? Don't you know when you became a believer, you were united by God with Jesus and it was a union with his death? Paul goes on, verse 4, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that just as Christ Jesus was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. This is not a, a future of eschatological reality. In other words, the resurrection described here is not an end times resurrection. This is not the resurrection of the dead we'll look at in a few minutes in 1 Corinthians 15. This is the resurrection to new life in Christ. You were buried with him in baptism into death and raised to new life with him now. Verse five, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we will also be in the likeness of his resurrection. This is not like saying, if you, are, if you die with Christ, you will be raised to bodily resurrection in the end times. Um, this is more like saying, if you stop eating, you will be hungry. <laughs> this is a, a future of certain consequence, not a future of future history realities. What's described here is the certainty that we walk in newness of resurrection life. Verse 6, knowing this, knowing that we have died with Christ and we now walk with him by faith, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. To what end? In order that our body of sin might be progressively done away with so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. The Christian life is a new reality, free from the tyranny of sin, the slavery and bondage to sin, and new in life. Without the specter of death, living resurrection, empowered life from God. That's the now. There is, of course, resurrection life to come, 1 Corinthians 15. All those who experience spiritual resurrection, Ephesians 2.5, made alive by God who experienced the old man having died by union with Christ and by union with Christ living now in resurrection power, all of those will experience future bodily resurrection. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 35. But someone will say, 
How are the dead raised? And, and with what kind of body do they come? As if questioning the, the details of what physical bodies would look like derail the truth of resurrection. Not at all. But just in case we wanted to know, Paul gives us some of the details anyway. You fool, he says. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And he uses here the illustration of sowing seeds in the ground. That which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished. And to each of us, the seeds, a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh. There is one flesh of men, another of beasts, another of birds, another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. The glory of the heavenly is one. The glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, another of the moon, another of the stars. Star differs from star in glory. So also the resurrection of the dead. The seed, or the body, is sown perishable, raised imperishable. What an incredible contrast. The body you live in now is decaying, degenerating. It is perishing. It's perishable. The body that will be raised will be different as the watermelon seed is different from the watermelon vine and the fruits that it produces. One comes from the other, but the properties are radically different. What comes out is imperishable, not able to perish. It is sown, verse 43, in dishonor, raised in glory. Think about the last moments of an earthly existence. No matter how the demise happens, you are at your weakest and most dishonorable at your last moments on this earth. Raised in glory. Glory. The glory that God shares with those who believe. The glory that all the created order waits for the sons of God to resemble. The glorious bodily resurrection that will be in conformity to Jesus' own glorious resurrection body. It is sown in weakness, raised in power. It is sown natural. It is raised supernatural. Look down at verse 48. As is the earthy, so also those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. What is the Christian life? It means going from spiritually dead and physically dying to still physically dying, but very much spiritually alive to absent from the body, present with the Lord, very much alive with him. Or if you're on the earth when Christ returns for his people, instantly translated into glorious resurrection body without death. And then ultimately for all who believe leads to a glorious resurrection, the unification of a spirituality and a physicality perfect for eternity in God's presence. An empty tomb changes everything for us. Because he rose, sins are forgiven. Because he rose, death is altered. Because he rose, resurrection life is experienced now and bodily resurrection is guaranteed for all who are in him. And because he rose, he is unmistakably God in the flesh, the Messiah, our death-conquering, sin-forgiving Savior, the King of all kings. He is the author of life, the Prince of life, the giver of life. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the way and the truth and the life. And to him be all praise. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming to the earth condescending to be amongst us, to take on flesh, to dwell with us, to 
put up with us, and then to put on yourself our sins. Ugly, vile, heinous crimes against your beautiful, perfect holiness and justice. And while your goodness in the presence of our sin could only radiate out in eternal punishment, your love in the presence of sinners moved you to be a substitute in our place, to take what we deserved, to give us life where there was only death to be found. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being the all-conquering one who could defeat death, rise from your own grave, and give life to all whom you wish. We sing your praises now. Our hearts are full. May they be full of these truths every walking moment that you give us left on this earth for your glory, and for a world that desperately needs to hear this good news. In your glorious name we pray.